it's my pleasure to uh, to introduce uh, Bill Kassman, who will be talking about uh, the early days of Langland's conjectures. Yeah, so let me explain at the beginning. I have no idea what I'm about. I mean, I don't really know what I'm going to tell you about. So I've tried to explain <laughs> Langland's conjectures for nearly 40 years, and never entirely successfully. But recently, I um, contracted um, literally contracted with some other people to write a book about the language conjectures. And the publisher explained very carefully that this book was meant for non-experts. So I had a meeting with my co-authors yesterday, and we still have no idea what the book is going to do. Um, but like, we keep trying different things. And so as you listen to what I have to say, I want you to uh, accumulate criticisms. And then you can give me feedback, and then the book will improve, right? Right. So, the problem is that the non-experts are an extremely wide range. Um, so let me start, but the, the, the main problem, me and my co-authors, I and my co-authors face is that um, the, the subject has grown enormously. The, it's, actually, the subject is almost exactly 50 years old. Langlands uh, discovered his conjectures in 1966, in December of 66. And it's, it's grown in the north side of mushroom that just keeps on growing and growing. It's fragmented to different pieces spread all over the world. But there's still some very basic ideas which don't seem to be uh, well understood by anybody except experts. So the basic idea is very simple. It's all about L functions. It's, I can't say that at the beginning and the end of Weinman's conjectures are about L functions, but it's a major component. So what do I mean by an L function? Well, it's a very, there are different kinds of L functions, but the ones I have in mind have very special properties. So one, uh, they have Euler products. That means it's some product over P. And I'll, I'll restrict myself in some sense. I, very limited thing. We'll look over P over uh, integral products of a uh, one over P sub P to P to the minus S. Where P sub P equals a polynomial. Uh, for all P. And second of all, um wait a second, what what does that mean? There's no equal sign. <laughs> well, <laughs> Who is they? An, an arithmetic L function has an Euler product. That means it can be represented. Is there a function? Is it a function of what? Well, yes, it, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's called a L of S. Of, of S. Okay. Yes, it's a function of S. I think the question is is that a definition or a product here? Well, I, haven't said, I haven't said a thing yet. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not a definition, it's not a theorem, it's just an idea. Okay. So this is the first statement. So now this eliminates, for example, there are different kinds of L functions in this world. Um, but this eliminates a, a lot of the ones that people look at uh, for different reasons. There are different reasons for looking at L functions in general, but this automatically restricts quite a few. Second of all, um, you can add some factors. two kinds of factors. So A, uh, some number n to some power s, something, something, something involving s, um, for a finite, uh, n is a positive integer. And B, uh, some gamma factors, some factors involving gamma functions. Does add mean multiplied by? Uh, Does well, add mean I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't said yet. Again, I haven't <laughs> said yet. Okay, so we have, so I have it written down, so such that, so I define a function E of S associated to this, it's gamma factors times N to the S times uh, L of S. Okay. And then the next part for the is that there's some functional equation. Um, so this is C of 
Let's, so this is L, but it depends on the, the collection P sub P. And uh, some, so this again depends on the collection P sub P of S equals Z of 1 minus S for some other collection, say Q of sub P. Uh, times some factor, some um, factor which doesn't depend on this at all. And then fourth, um, I, yeah, so I'll say something about that. So um, C of S is neuromorphic. And C um, with nice, I don't know, again, it's not a general thing, nice poles, whatever that means. Okay? So, yes, oh no, okay. I think I have camera was reading this one. So, the question is, the question which in some sense Langlands might have answered or might not, nobody really, so nobody knows quite what these are, but the question is, can you classify such functions? Now, the answer is, probably nobody will ever know if I pose the question in such general terms, but Langlands does have an answer of some kind. Um, and in some sense, there's a kind of universal uh, source of L functions in some sense. I'll get around to explaining what that is. Uh, but it doesn't tell you very much to know that. It, it, there's a sort of a finer structure of classification. That's what I want to talk about. Um, and um, so and when I say, can you classify, this means can I provide a list of functions which, in fact, satisfy all of these properties. So what Langlands has is a list, but he has and in some sense, again, I say it's a complete classification, but it doesn't tell you very much. Um, so the classification includes verifying all of these problems. Now, why would you look at these type of Hello? Why would you look at these type of functions? I'm, I'm sorry, my, my hearing is very fast. My voice is very fast. <laughs> why would you look at this kind of function? Why do you want to look at them? Yes. Why? Okay, so I will, I will give some examples yeah, and explain. Yeah. <laughs> so the, wh why you want to look at such functions is because um, almost all functions which are known in any strong sense have immediate arithmetic applications, um, usually related to prime number distributions or, uh, in fact, rational points in algebraic values. It's an enormous source of information about number theory. Now, the, the functions which one actually knows to have applications are among those which one knows all of these properties exist and are very nice, and there's still an enormous number of conjectures. It's very hard to ver actually verify. These, can, these properties in any one case. But Langlands does have an answer. So let me give you the general scheme of his answer. So I take a complex group over C. It's called a reductive group. Or will be a reductive group. So for example, I can take GLNC or the symplectic group SP2NC, et cetera, et cetera, almost any complex algebraic group that you like. It doesn't have to be connected. I'll give some examples uh, where it doesn't be. So for example, it could be the Galois group. Disconnected group of uh, K over Q. Uh, these are all eligible examples. I take such a group, and I take a representation of this group. Just an example of how things work. I take, uh, yes, I take a G of P equals a, a set of elements in G hat, one for each P. Okay, so these are the basic ingredients of Langlands of formulation. And now I look at the product of all P of 1 over the determinant of i minus uh, rho of gp over p to the s. And this I'll call l over section g of p. Okay. Now, this is the general formulation of what a Langlands L function is. So, in fact, so in some sense, it, it seems very likely that, that these things, but I have to tell you, what the restriction is, yes. 
What's the, what's the, can you re reread the denominator there? It's yeah, hold on. <clears throat> okay. Do you infringing over rational primes? I, I, I'm restricting everything. To, in, in fact, you can, in fact, it, it, there, there are variations of this. I can look at arbitrary algebraic number fields. I can look at function fields over finite fields. There are huge variations, but um, if you look at arbitrary number fields, then you can restrict yourself to, by, by some technical trick. You can look only at, you can reduce yourself only to rational primes. Um, and uh, this is only a, a, a kind of the one because, in fact, there are variations in this, which I'll mention in ju just a moment. Um, so, but this is the general kind of, this is the general thing, so there are variations. This thing, what does rho of g of p divided by p of the x mean? Well, uh, rho is a finite dimensional representation. Okay. And this is an element of g of c, of g for each p. So this is a scalar times a matrix. Okay. And I take the determinant. Okay. I take minus x. So one, one important thing to notice is this depends only on the conjugacy class of G. So I'm not really specifying. I mean, in practice, one specifies the element itself of the group, but in, in, in reality, you're specifying only the conjugacy. That's an important feature of the way this, this writes down. So um, I'll, I'll give some examples in just, just a moment. There are variations on this. So I take product not over all P, but P not a number of some of when they set. Um, and so on and so on. I mean, there, there are an infinite number of variations. I can, I can look at um, P over P, where this is included in some number field, uh, and so on. So there's just an infinite number of variables. This is the basic uh, scheme into which all such things apply. Now, the question is, what families? So this, these are the kinds of L functions which Langlands, in fact, invented. Satisfy uh, properties one to four. Okay. Now, um, I'll give some examples in just a moment. The thing is that up until Langland's conjectures were formulated in 1967, there were a lot of examples of such functions. And there are a lot of other ideas about what a good L function was in some sense. So I, I was reviewing a number of papers from that period uh, just recently, and I found that even John Tate, for example, um, doesn't quite, he has a number of, John Tate is working on what are now known as the Tate conjectures, and he has a number of L functions in the paper, but his L functions don't satisfy, he makes some funny assumption that his L functions don't satisfy the nice coarse structure, wherever I stated that. Um, yeah, right here. So it's been funny. It wasn't, up until 1967, it just wasn't clear what a, an arithmetic L function ought to be in some sense. There were lots of candidates which had interesting properties, but somehow once Langmans uh, set up this scheme, then it became clear that this was somehow the canonical formulation. What's interesting is that Serre, in some sense, I think, did understand that, because he never, he never makes a mistake to take that. It's a curious fact about in intuition, I would say. Okay, so, so here's the question. Now, the answer to this is actually very complicated. So, so Langlands has an answer to that. Constant term in the functional equation of gamma factors 
the whole, the whole thing. He, he, he has some mechanism, some single mechanism, which, which gives you all at once in a way, the, the way to construct the L function, what its likely functional equation is, its behavior, the number of, the way the poles behave and so on. It's sort of a full, a full scheme to answer that question. But, um, the answer is a little bit complicated. So, so I'll try to give you uh, the answer by, mostly by example. But before I get into the complicated part, let me review some elementary examples. <coughs> so remember, I'm trying to write a book in which I do all this um, for non-experts. So if you have any better suggestions of how to do it, I'll be happy to see it. Blindness himself is a terrible expositor, um, actually even for experts. Jack will remember, I think, Langens once gave a seminar at the Institute called Informal Lectures on Automorphic Forms. And in full 19, this is maybe, I don't know, 1975 or so, something like that. And uh, he gave the lectures in the old full 119, some of you remember. Audience was completely full, the room was backed up. I believe Jack was standing in the back, but I'm not sure. I was sitting towards the back. The lecture was incomprehensible. <laughs> Somebody asked, I think Jack actually asked, what does informal lecture mean? And Langman said, it means I don't have to prepare. <laughs> the audience for the second lecture consists of about six people. Okay, so let me give some examples. So the, of course, the elementary example is the zeta function. Once you have an oil product, you have a, a directly uh, series of some kind. So this is I, you know, n to the minus s, the product of character. So it satisfies a multiplicative property. Um, and then I have some more interesting ones defined by Hecke. I'll say something a little bit more about each one of these in just a moment. Um, but for example, I can take. Um, See how to see this pi over. Mm -hmm. I'll write it like that, but it is a very nice series. Extremely well known, the zeta function, very clay L functions associated with characters of integers. The last one is that I think Hecke was probably the first one to define it, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but he, what I do is I look at the Gaussian integers, and I look at Gaussian integers modulo the units, or four units in the ring of algebraic integers, and I look at this, this is a character, if I take a, a, a Gaussian integer, I just divide it by its thing, and then I take it to the power of 4 and 4 because um, I'm only interested in the ideal expansion. And this just means the absolute value of this. And that, that does have an early expansion, this product over all Gaussian products. Um, and well, it's a little different from what I said before, but you can write it as something over QP as well. Now, these are particularly interesting, and these were among, so for the, most of the 19th and early 20th century, these are the kind of L functions which one looked at. You can use zeta of s, what we all know, for all kinds of things to say about distributions of primes. Um, the same is true for Dirichlet L functions. Dirichlet invented them, um, not for complex values of S, but for real values of S. And what he proved very easily um, was that primes are distributed in arithmetic sequences of relatively prime integers, of prime to P. In fact, uniformly distributed in some sense. It's a very nice result. Um, and there are the whole host of similar things like this. The Hecke character, for example, can be used to prove a kind of Dirichlet theorem only in that case, 
you look at the Gaussian integers and you want to know about primes distributed angular, an angular distribution of primes. And this is exactly what you need to see that, in fact, Gaussian, the primes of the Gaussian integers are equidistributed uh, according to the Euclidean angle of the Gaussian term. Hecker proved a number of other similar results. For example, you can define something similar for real quadratic fields, and then you get equidistributed with respect to non Euclidean angle. Okay. All kinds of similar results of that, all leading to some kind of equidistribution. Another example is if I take Q over Q gamma and I let um, G equal to group, and then I take pi equals the representation of finite dimensional G. And then I take uh, the product number over 1 minus, well, determinant of I minus um, pi of the Banius by P to the S. This is our name. This can be used, for example, very easily. It gives a, this gives a very natural, using this function and looking at arguments similar to Dirichlet's, can give a very natural argument, for example, that um, the, prime, the primes of the field, uh, k over uh, q, are equidistributed in conjugacy classes. You, you define for each element, well, it, it depends on this. So p is not a member of some uh, set s, which is equal, in some sense, to the conductor, set of bad primes. And then you can show that um, for each P not an S is a well-defined conjugacy class of elements in the Galois group over that. Not, not an element itself, but because they're different. Each, each prime of the field extension K over uh, P defines a Frobenius element, and that's defined uniquely up to conjugacy. And then you can show that such primes are equidistributed in the conjugacy classes. So that's another similar application. Okay, there are other applications. For example, uh, zeta functions look like this, turned out to be the Hasse-Bay zeta functions of certain elliptic curves. And that's a very that's a theme that continues on for quite a while. Are there any questions? No. Oh, I've lost somebody, I can tell that. I've lost you. Tony, ask a question. No. <laughs> These things all look like the zeta function, is that? Well, yeah, they're all variations. I mean, the, the point of Euler products is they're all variations on the original zeta function, um, except that as you get more complicated, you know less and less about them. So, for example, um, it, it, when Artin developed these, and there's a beautiful, actually, for those of you who want to learn more about it, there's a beautiful set of uh, notes on the internet by Peter Roquette um, on the history of such functions, for example. Extremely beautiful notes. Maybe three or four of them all together, a couple of papers, something like that, uh, where he, he goes through the correspondence between Hasse and Artin and a few other people, uh, which outlines the history of how Artin came to, to understand what we, what we know about such things. Um, and it, it's extremely complicated. So if I said well, I have these properties one through four, and the, in the case of Artin, he had a lot of trouble with, I think, property number three in, in order to define the S, and the, there's some constant that appears in the functional equation. Um, Martin had a lot of trouble just finding out what n should be. And it turns out, even nowadays, it's an extremely difficult uh, question as to quite what that, it's called the n that appears in the function equation, is called the conductor of the extension, or the conductor of the representation. And even now, it, it's a very mysterious number in some sense. It's, uh, and Martin's own definition is almost miraculous. But Kit gives you some idea of how Martin came up with it, but there's no real trace of how it happened. It is still, in some sense, still an active subject of research. For the second part, so for the n, that gives you the conductor of the representation of, which appears in the function equation. And the constant is even more interesting. Um, Artin just proves there is some constant. And it's, it's a very, very mysterious subject. It wasn't completely understood until, Langlands, again, Langlands came along and explained, uh, in some sense, what the structure of that constant was. In many cases, for example, you can prove that it's plus or minus one without knowing whether it's plus one or minus one. Extremely difficult question. Um, 
But again, as these things get more complicated, the applications become a little more arcane. So there's no, it, it's a, it's a trade-off in some sense. So that there's an industry of just understanding what the definitions of these things are, rather than their properties in a sense, with the hope that someday, uh, for civilization ends, somebody will understand. <laughs> Any questions at all? I need a question. Are these all the examples? Hello. Are these all your examples? Or you oh, no. No, I have, I have one more example I'm going to give. Wait, do you have an example you want to suggest? No, I mean, no. I, but I have two examples in mind, and I'm curious to see which one you can use. <laughs> 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 ah, but that's very easy. Which one do you think I should give next? I have one in mind. I, I'm not going to change my mind. I'm just curious to know what you have. I'm guessing you're going to do modular forms. Yes, but, but I'm going to give Heck as example. Say one thing. Um, my report card from fifth grade is on my icebox. I put it up there when my daughter was in fifth grade and she got a very bad grade in handwriting. And I found about the same time I found my own report card, I get F in handwriting in fifth grade. And as you can see, it hasn't improved since. It's associated to mother reforms. So let's define a space. SK of gamma only, let's, let's make things simple, let's take gamma equals SO2Z, and X on the upper half plane. Okay. And the X on uh, forms, F of Z times DZ, to the k. So these are differential forms, um, the powers of differential forms. So if I just had the dz, it's all the ordinary holomorphic differential forms. So f and z is holomorphic. <coughs> okay, and um, we look at the gamma invariant forms. So s of k uh, gamma equals uh, gamma invariant forms of this kind. Uh, with an extra property. So if I have such a form, so f of z plus 1 is equal to f of z. And so f of z is equal to sum n equals 0. Well, uh, I want to assume it's, it's equal to 1 to infinity cn or p to the 2 pi r and z. And uh, this is a holomorphic expansion. So this is my space. These are called cusp forms of weight 2K. The dimension of such forms is 0 for small k. But it grows quite rapidly, this k grows. Easy enough to derive a formula for the dimension um, by using Riemannian rope. And now Hecke defines some operators, some algebraic correspondences. Correspondence. Well, um, what these are, these are forms equals forms on the curve uh, h divided by gamma. And this can be, this is included, I'll, let me call this x gamma. 
This is included in x gamma bar, which is equal to x gamma union some points of infinity. And in fact, just one point of infinity. Um, and again, that's the local expansion of infinity, so they, they find that infinity. And um, this, is an, this is a compact algebraic curve. Um, and then algebraic correspondence uh, is something in the product of x gamma bar, x gamma bar. That. And so it's not a map from one this to itself, but it's an algebraic correspondence, meaning each point here corresponds to a finite number of points there. And what are the hyper correspondences? Well, in order to understand best, I think you have to look at actually Heckham himself made the, the perfect definition. Since then, there's been a lot of mangling of Heckham's definition. But I think the best exposition of this is in a little book by Sarah. So, gamma quotient H is a quotient of gamma quotient G of 2 R. Um, because H G of 2 R acts on this, the trivial, uh, the center X trivial, they're part of the, well, the connected component of the center X trivial on this. And um, this is equal to, this parameterizes lattices. In uh, Z in R2. This is a plus, plus, plus basis. No, I'm sorry, just lattices or so. And now, so the way to think of this is somehow related. In fact, there's a, a close relationship between the two. Basically, you can identify this with a subset of this. And now, if I have a lattice here, then Hector square spline takes L to all the lattices included in R, such that L over M is isomorphic to Z by M. This is called operator T sub L. These TNs commute with each other. That's easy to see, actually. And then we have a very nice multiplicative property. Uh, T times P times Q is equal to TP. Times T2 if these are relatively prime. And they're very nice operators on this space SK. And so um, you can divide SK gamma equals a sum of eigenspaces uh, for the TS. And now I can form from this product over all P. Of one over one minus tp. Well, uh, I'll write it like this formula: times p to the minus s plus tpp uh, times p to the minus 2s. Uh, in fact, under this, these circumstances, I'll just make it one. And uh, I can factor this as one minus alpha times p to the minus s times one minus alpha minus one. Times p to the minus s. There are various normalizations possible um, to change this concept here by changing weights around. It's very easy for various reasons for doing that, but this is uh, the simplified, the simplest one. And this is a hyper element. Okay. Discover these, but the motivation is very interesting. So the first one of these that was discovered was discovered by Raman Newton. Um, as a result of investigations into properties of quadratic forms, or sums of squares. So um, Raman Newton's top function. I don't, but after that is a in between, Wardell. Hello? The answer is something that Wardell introduced in the between. Right? Um, have you read Wardell's paper? Actually, I should have that. So I, I, I look, I, must have what, one of my co-authors has actually read Wardell's paper very carefully. Yeah. And um, it's a very interesting paper. It, it, it doesn't say what you might hope it says. Okay. Um, 
Best of all, my co-author pointed out, I think it's the last remark in the paper says, I won't investigate further because there seems to be no future in this subject. <laughs> um, we have a, actually, we, by now, my co-authors and I have a bunch of uh, quotations where everybody seems to say the theory of modular forms is dead. We'll just forget about it for a while. Um, but it, it keeps on going in spite of that. Wardell. I met Wardell once. I, I, he seemed to be a very dense, dense person. Anyway, he did, he did some very nice things. So one of them is the Ramanujan 2 function, a uh, top function, and top. He, Ramanujan conjectured, I mean, basically, uh, he calculates it, which is incredible. And he conjectured the multiplicity property, the tau m n equals tau m times tau n if m n are relatively prime. And uh, Wardell proved this. Um, I don't know, I, should, I have to read with the paper. But it, for Wardell, it was really just a one off. He didn't look at any other cases again. He just looked at Ramanujan's function and defined a kind of operator, a heck of an operator. So it had something to do with that. The point is that you can you find yourself looking at tau n. These, these tau n become the coefficients of the Fourier expansion. And uh, this is what Ramanujan and Wardell looked at, and it's not too hard to construct a heck operator very directly in that case. Hecke, between Wardell and Hecke, so Wardell, I think, 1919, something like that. And then Hecke's operators appear around 1935. Um, it's not quite clear what his immediate motivation was, but he's certainly aware that Wardell has started to be in this sense. Well, now, these functions are very interesting. Uh, Hecke proved the functional equation <coughs> And um, the question of constants is more interesting. So the question of the conductor cell, so I say, a, a good L function has attached to it a function n to the s, and it also has some constant in the functional equation. And I could never even consider the question. Uh, he has some kind of abstract functional equation, which says that if I take a function, which is an eigenfunction, the TNs. And then I can form my LSF like over there. And then this is equal to L and 1 minus S times F prime. Where F prime is some other function, which he tells you what it is, but it's kind of vague. It's not there's no normalization involved. So you, all you know is that F prime is something, but it, it's very vague as to exactly what it is. The function F you can pin down by constants because you can start off with a, a function one here for tau one. But he doesn't tell you what the, what the first term of the equation is. So there's some kind of mystery involved. And he, the, again, the n to the s is not entirely clear either. He gets something, but it's kind of vague as to exactly what he gets. Now, these functions became ridiculously more interesting um, when Eichler and Shimura proved that these are the Hasebe zeta functions. These turn out to be, oh, for k equals 1, these turn out to be some of these. Turn out to be a Hasebe's data function, elliptic curves. himself was actually aware of this for a funny reason. So sometime in the 1920s, Hasse had proved that the zeta functions of certain elliptic curves were actually the ones constructed from uh, characters of the kind I showed before for the, the Gaussian integers. And Hecke knew that um, those functions occurred among years. In other words, there's some relationship between the, those Hecke characters of quadratic imaginary fields and modular forms. So he kind of vaguely knew this. So it wasn't a complete surprise that has that Edward and Shimura proved this. Um, but what was a complete surprise in 1967? They proved the theorem that told you that all Hasse-Bay zeta functions, or elliptic curves, if they were nice zeta functions at all, had to occur in this way.
Now, um, so how are these examples of what I call Langlands or arithmetic functions before, or the, among Langlands classification? So in this case, um, in this last case, so the others easily fit into the scheme I mentioned with the g hat and so on. In the last case, g hat is GO2. And my, my representation rho is equal to GO2 plus to GO2, so-called standard representation. Um, and in this case also, so here's my alpha and my alpha minus 1. Um, I can define, I can look at other rows. In this case, equal to the symmetric powers of the standard representation, also irreducible. So I'll have, in this case, it's one, the p factor is one over alpha to the p um, times um, one minus alpha. Uh, to the k times p to the minus s times 1 minus alpha to the k minus 2 times p minus and so on, and 1 minus alpha minus k times p to the minus s. So these are other L functions associated to the same alpha, but different representations of the group. And Sarah, in a very nice set of lecture notes from the 60s, shows that if you understand these representations, if you understand these zeta functions very well, um, then there are lots of arithmetic significance number theory, uh, interest in that. In particular, for example, the way conjectures fall up in that. So if you knew properties one to four for these, uh, all kinds of interesting things fall up. Among it, the way conjecture, and in fact, uh, Deleen used the variant of series observation to prove the vacant judge. Are there any questions? Do you have another question, Mr. In the corner there? No? Okay. So I have to tell you what Langlands now did. So now, with all these examples in mind, um, Langlands has the following scheme. So we want to know, so given what well, Langlands says the following, given g hat, remember it's a complex group, algebraic group over c, and we take rho, and um, we want to know to find a set of gp. G, G hat. Such that L of S and so on has nice properties. So the way Langs does it as follows. So G hat, let, let's take a special case. Uh, I take G hat is, is what's known as, well, I'll just take it, first of all, just to be G O N C. So it's a little, it turns out to be a little confusing to do it, but it, it's okay. And now I take my group G to be G O N over Q. And I look at, um, and, and I take my gamma to be GLN. I'm being a little rough in this, but it, it's approximately correct. I take gamma to be GLNZ. And I look at certain functions. I look at the quotient of GLNZ divided by, uh, GLNC divided by GLNZ. Now, in the case of the Dirichlet functions, you're looking at something like this where you're looking at the multiplicative group instead of GLS, so you're looking at n equals 1. But now, Langlands was the first person to really make extremely strong use of the fact that we have a representation of GLNC on this, acting on the right. So this is a representation space. Of group GLNC, but it's infinite dimensional. So it's not a representation space that most people at the time were familiar with, unless you happen to know the work of Gelfand and Harish Tandra. 
But why, why do you have GL and ZF in a complex group rather than a real group? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. So it's kind of funny, right? You start with a group over the complex numbers, and then you're somehow looking at an arithmetic group, and so Z and R somehow appear out of magic, and that's there's something called Langmans duality appearing here. So what Langmans tells you is, if I take any connected reductive algebraic group, over C, then that corresponds to a um, reductive group over Q. And I let gamma equal, it turns out to make sense to talk about, we call it G. It turns out to make sense to define the integral points of that group. And I let G act on G of R, act on this. And now, what I do once I have that, this becomes the representation space, the C says of GL and R. And now, well, a little bit was known about this, but very little. But if you say, if you knew a little bit about work with Gelfand and Harris Chandra, and actually a little bit later, Zelberg, then you can understand that what should happen for GLM2. So the heck is the case of, what could be the case of n equals 2 that I'm looking at the Hecke case? Uh, otherwise, I'm looking at something considerably more complicated, but something was not about these representations. Um, and so, if, what you wind up doing is you're looking at the L2 space. So, GLN are acts on this and preserves the volume. And so, you can look at L2 of this, and this turned out to have a discrete part plus a continuous part. And it turns out that from each one of these, in some sense, you can construct a lot of L functions. Right, so the GPs involved, well, the GPs are things coming from the Hecke algebra. So certain Hecke operators. Can be defined on this space. So what are the Hecke operators? Well, in this case, uh, G a number of so if I take, um, let's say this, so each double cosine uh, of gamma modulo m n is in, well, like gamma defines, this is a, a double cosine, and that goes to an al some kind of algebraic correspondence. These are real metals, not complex anymore, but it still makes sense. You go real metal on your quotient. Now, this is the hardest part of explaining the Langmans conjectures. Is these double cosets are, I'm, I'm assuming things very special, so we're just looking at GLNZ. These double cosets again have multiplicative properties. So for each lattice, so in some sense this also, this, this space also is, is parametrized as lattices. So gamma and Rn. And each the, the Hecke operators correspond to if I have an M in here and I apply it to the lattice, I get some smaller lattice. So if I have a lattice L goes to all M containing L such that the determinant, well, such that the size of L divided by L equals M. And these also have multiplicative properties. That, that's my operator T N. But I, in fact, what you know is that you can classify the lattices contained in a given lattice. The principal divisor theorem tells you that that classification is. So first of all, it's easy to see that it's multiplicative. Tn, m is equal to T n times m, they're both relatively uh, prime. And so you, the special case 
his n is uh, a power of p. Now in this case, the n contained in, for example, z to the n uh, correspond to matrices p1, n1, p2, n2, to the p, uh, n, and n, where n1 is less than p, n2. And so on. this is the principal divisor term. And so you get operators T of P1, N1, P2, N2, and so on. And this corresponds to a double cosine. Okay. So I get half operators defined by this, and you can identify. So the main theorem, which is due to Sataki, much earlier in the 60s, but didn't have much consequence immediately, is that um, the ring of operators you get are defined by these, of such operators, is isomorphic to symmetric polynomials. Papers is very clever, but it somehow didn't. A lot of people looked at it and didn't know quite what to make of it, including Satake, I think. It has, it's a very beautiful paper, but he wasn't quite sure. He knew it had something to do with L functions, but he wasn't quite sure what. But what Linus observed is very simple, and after that, it sort of changed the nature of the subject entirely. The point is that the symmetric polynomials of n variables correspond exactly to semi simple conjugacy classes. That is to say, diagonal matrices and G L N C. So, let's look at it this way. I have a, a bunch of Hecke operators acting on this space. It acts in very nice ways. I can decompose the space of, of certain functions on the quotient into eigenspaces for the Hecke operators. So I have so good subspaces. Of, uh, of L2 discrete correspond to um, eigen, well, correspond to eigenspaces of the Hecke operators, correspond to homomorphisms from this ring. And to C. Now, this is a nice ring. If I look at the invariant polynomials, that corresponds to an algebraic variety. It's a finally generated, in fact, it's isomorphic to. Uh, this turns out also to be a polynomial ring, c times x1 up to xn, and the symmetric polynomials, that's the observation of Newton's. So what this corresponds to exactly, this means such a homomorphism. This, the ring here is an affine, this is an, an affine algebraic ring, and it parameterizes the conjugacy classes in GOM, the semi simple conjugacy classes. So, if I have an eigenspace for the Hecke operators, I look at this, it gives me a homomorphism that corresponds to an element GP, a member of GLN of C. And these are the GPs which occur in Langlis conjunction. So, in general, um, if I take G hat, it goes to the group G defined over Q. So G, this is over C, right? Wayman's construction of sort of general abstract business about inductive groups, it's going to be a group over Q. This tells me if I look at, I construct the space L2 discrete of gamma and gamma equals G or Z. This gives me a representation on this. I look at the discrete part goes to eigenspaces from uh, Hecke operators. This gives me for each P, if I just look at the P components, the P, the P, 
components of the Heck algebra for each uh, p, an element gp, the number of g hat. And then I look at, for each row, uh, I get an L function, ls of uh, gp. That's the general constructor of Langer's O functions. Now, so we have GLN is G or? Hello? We have GLN is G or? Uh, G, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, that, that's a good set. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in general, I mean, ah, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. G. But, uh, have I made an NM6? No, I don't think so. So this, in a way, this is the most general kind of arithmetic L function defined by Langmans, but it turns out that something much more dramatic happens. So, so the first fact is that for certain, so, so the next problem is, so now I know in, in a sense what, I, what at least I have a very large class of good L functions, which conjecturally satisfy those properties one to four, and it's not at all easy to see how all this nice new information gives you properties one to four. But there's one case in which you can do that. So, it turns out that if I take rho equals a standard representation of G on and C, then LS of GP constructed in this way uh, is and is, is, is satisfies one to four. This is a result of uh, Godemois and Jacquet uh, following conjectures of lines and techniques of T. Uh, they actually proved by Basically, by the, in a sense, by the same method that Riemann used to prove the functional equation and these properties for the zeta function, some variation of Poisson summation. Um, and so, what Langlands, what is, there's a second huge part of Langlands conjectures, which I haven't mentioned, something called functoriality. And that tells you that probably all, all, arithmetic L functions in my sense. In uh, the sense of one to four occur here. For G L A of Q. In the sense of one to one Q. Now uh, that's very nice in a sense. In another sense, it tells you nothing. It's a huge space, highly non-constructed. doesn't give you any information at all, but it, it's sort of an interesting fact. But Langens himself, up until very recently, and maybe even still now, believes that somehow the way to prove properties one to four for all these functions he constructs is to somehow verify um, that, it, that it occurs among the GLN uh, spaces somewhere. Just recently, there's been, so for a long time, well, I should say, so the Langlands conjectures in general say that if I look at such L functions, then they have these properties 1 to 4. It's not at all obvious, um, because we don't know that they all occur in the um, And there have been a number of different techniques from Arthur and Langlands and, and Langland himself and Shahidi and Kim, which apply techniques to prove it in many special cases. Um, but these techniques have come to a dead end. When, when Shahidi and Kim finished their work about 10 years ago, uh, there was no obvious future in sight to verify any more Langlands conjectures. Arthur improved it a little bit uh, by looking at a number of low dimensional accidents in a sense. But in the meantime, Langlands himself started something he calls beyond endoscopy. I won't tell you what endoscopy is, much less beyond endoscopy is. Um, but it, the idea is that somehow you use variations of the Selberg trace formula, which is a basic tool in this business, in some funny, very highly technical way uh, to explore new possibilities for looking at these L functions. Um, and Can you explain been... endoscopy? <coughs> Can you explain the word endoscopy? Yeah. <laughs> so, 
I have a quotation which I wish I knew by heart. It's in one of the P.G. Woodhouse books about Jeeves. Uh, at some point, Jeeves and Bertie Wooster need a tool to decide whether a, a jewel they're looking at is actually a diamond or not. And Jeeves somehow procures a machine called an endoscopy tool to look at this. And there's a great quotation about something. What endoscopy is, if you look up endoscopy, which is how the doctors pronounce it on the internet, you will find horrible implements of torture uh, because what they're used for is to penetrate certain orifices in the body and explore what's inside. So the whole point is that endoscopy is, is a technique of looking inside something. Now even for Langlands, that's what it means. So there's some... What endoscopy means for Langlands is he, he's taking one of these groups, one of these reductive groups, and he's somehow exploring in detail some aspects of the inner structure of the group. And that's what he meant the word to be. Now he, didn't invent the word himself. He asked um, a mathematician in Ohio, whose wife was a doctor, very suspicious. So when Langlands <laughs> asked this guy who knew Latin, who'd been trained in Latin actually, he asked him for a good Greek or Latin word that would apply. The guy came up with it and word that does got me. We suspect his wife had a hand in this. He <laughs> completely denies it. Hello? He denies it. I, I know, but I. I, I don't know. I, anyway, it, it's true. If you look up endoscopy, it will take you a while to find Langland's use of the word endoscopy. <laughs> and the uh, advertisements for these machines are phenomenal. Anyway, endoscopy is, is somehow, it's another lecture entirely. I, I, could, I could explain what endoscopy does for you that gets you to this point. But the point is, so the, the, the ultimate goal of this business at the moment is to look at the following situation. So I have a group G over R, say. Or over, over Q, I guess. Now, there's a very good classification of conjugacy classes in such a group. For GLN, it's very simple. You, you just look at uh, field extensions and sort of decompose and That gives you all the semi-simple conjugacy classes. You know exactly what the unipotent classes are and so on. For other groups, other than GLN, an interesting phenomenon occurs, which is, and so for GLN what happens is the, the semi-simple conjugacy classes are classified by the characteristic polynomial. For other groups, that's no longer the case. Already for SL2, for example, over SL2R, I can have two uh, elements. I can look at cos theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cos theta, or I can change this to a minus and this to a plus. These are indistinct, they're different conjugacy classes, but they have the same characteristic polynomial. Now, the goal of of the work up, up through the business of endoscopy is to somehow reduce analysis on this group to analysis on the characteristic polynomials. That's in a some sense probably in the long run that's probably what's going to happen. But what Langlands discovered was in order to make that work you have to take account of the fact that just as different kinds of gases uh, have the same characteristic polynomial so it's somehow different representations grouped together to match that, that um, disparity. And um, so, it, but still, at the, in a sense, the whole goal of the subject, in a way, that I understand it at least, is to somehow reduce analysis on G to analysis on characteristic classes by some sort of complicated Fourier transform. And in a sense, the beyond endoscopy explores that, that idea further. Um, there are people, there are several papers in recent times by Arthur. Jim Arthur of Bob Schauenbill and a student of Langlands named Altug um, who are working on exactly this. Actually, so am I this sense. It's an interesting byproducts which I'm interested in. But whether this will work or not, I don't know. This is, at the moment, this is the only hope for extending, for finding new proofs of Langlands conjectures is that this technique of beyond that and, and endoscopy. Um, I, I can't really tell you what it, what it does. It, it, it's a very difficult analytical problem. Basically, what uh, these people want to do is to apply the process. So earlier, all the proofs involved the process summation formula in some sense or another. And the, the new idea is to apply the process summation formula to the characteristic classes, the space of character classes, a nice f on space. Um, but in order to do that, you have to apply process summation to very nasty functions. So you find yourself dealing with very nasty singularities of these functions. And that's what Altuk's work is. <coughs> I'm through.
distribution theorem, which is attached to each of these uh, functions. Equidistribution is it related to. I'm sorry, say it again. So you mentioned that there are equidistribution theorem attached to some simple yeah. uh, functions. Yeah. Well, uh, there, there are some. Um, so, so, for example, there's something called the Sato Tate theorem. So, the, the way the Sato Tate theorem works is um, I take an uh, elliptic curve over Q. And I look at this Hasselbein data function, which means, say, I look at the number of points modulo p for each p in which the curve has good reduction. And then I get some eigenvalues. We know that the eigenvalues have absolute value p to the one half. So I take my eigenvalues, I divide by p to the one half, and I get uh, points on the unit circle. So you might ask, statistically, as p varies, what's the distribution of points on the unit circle? And the answer conjectured by both Sato and Table and Temino, it's the same as uh, the, uh, these are points on the absolute circle, and so they correspond to conjugacy classes in SU2. And it's conjectured a very long time ago that the distribution as P varies is the same as the measure of conjugacy classes for SU2. Now you can conjecture immediately from various tricks of Langlands that this is going to work for any automorphic form whatsoever. That it, it, it's, it's, um, so first of all, there will be some version of the Bay conjectures which applies to arbitrary discrete parts of the automorphic forms. And second of all, it will have some statistical distribution based on distributions of measures on conjugacy classes. And other similar questions. So, and they're all, there's a, a well-known technique for dealing with this in some way, um, but it, 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 there's no, no way of getting any results until you can know more. Do you have your book available somewhere? Anywhere? Do you have a draft of your book available? <coughs> no. 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 Until yesterday, we didn't have an outline of the book. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the authors, one of my co-authors resisted violently the outline they came up with. Who are the co-authors? Ah, uh, Julia Mueller and uh, Michael Volpato. They're in New York, in New York City. Oh. Langlands is greatly in favor of the book, but he's also greatly in favor of telling us how to write the books. I don't know. <laughs> I'll see all these people um, Friday afternoon. Any more questions? Okay. I'm disappointed with your contributions to improvement. <laughs> <laughs>